Okay, good morning. Thank you all very much for coming along to this talk on how did Linux become a mainstream embedded operating system. Um, so I am Chris Simmons. I've been uh, using Linux as an embedded operating system for 20 years now. Um, I've also written a book on the subject. Just saying, it's quite a good book if you want to uh, Call me, uh, contact me later, I can give you a, a copy. Um, and you can contact me in various uh, electronic ways. But the main thing I want to do is to talk about uh, embedded Linux. So we all know that uh, Linux started in 1991 when Linus Torvalds uh, sent the famous uh, email saying, I'm working on a free open source uh, operating system for Intel i386 and i486 uh, processors. Um, but the very nature of it being uh, open source meant that it was portable. It could be ported to different uh, systems. And so people very quickly started latching onto the idea that we could run Linux on non-desktop uh, systems, uh, on computers inside equipment, and control that equipment. So that's the story that I want to tell. And I'm going to start off by the, the first uh, kind of pre-embedded phase, uh, 95 to 99. So during this period, the basic building blocks of embedded Linux uh, were kind of put together. Uh, the first thing is that embedded systems, particularly embedded systems of that time, had very little memory and storage. So uh, we had to make Linux small. A guy called uh, Bruce Perrins had a similar problem, but a different application area. So Bruce was working in, um, uh, as part of the Debian team, and he especially wanted to be able to make Debian easier to install. And in particular, he wanted to be able to install Linux, uh, Debian, I should say, uh, from a floppy disk. And just for the younger members of the audience, <laughs> this is a floppy disk, okay? This is a three and a half inch, 1.44 megabyte storage floppy disk. Okay, I'll tell you one interesting thing about floppy disks. They're actually not floppy. But there you go. Yeah, well. <laughs> This is an older floppy disk, uh, and these ones actually are very floppy. Um, but actually, by the time that Linux came along, these were obsolete, and everyone was using these less floppy floppy disks. So the challenge is then, how do you get Linux uh, onto something with only 1.44 uh, megabytes of storage uh, and boot it and do something useful? And the key concept here was a thing called BusyBox. So BusyBox is a really magic uh, tool. It uh, takes a whole bunch of command line uh, tools, uh, including an init program, uh, file manipulation things like uh, copy and move, uh, things to mount and unmount, uh, things to set up networks, everything you need to get a basic Linux system up and running. And the way BusyBox is constructed, it's really small. Uh, at the time that this was done, BusyBox was a few hundred kilobytes. Even today, BusyBox lives on. A typical BusyBox implementation is about a megabyte, which is pretty small. So with BusyBox and, and a stripped down Linux kernel, we could put Linux onto a floppy disk and boot it up, and that then initiated the Debian install routines. Coincidentally, though, he had accidentally uh, also designed uh, the basis of almost every embedded Linux system since that date. Pretty much everything that runs embedded Linux actually has BusyBox inside it. Um, a little evolu evolution of this, um, a couple of years later, a guy called Dave Sinji came along, and he took the bootable uh, floppy disk idea and he, add, he added in some networking tools, 
so that you could turn any computer, any, any regular PC with a floppy disk drive uh, into a router. So you have your standard PC with two or more network cards into it, boot it from the LRP disk, and you've got a high-end router. Well, high-ish end router for the time of, uh, that we're talking about. And then that a further evolution of the LRP came along when Dave Tart and Greg Rutkowski uh, added in wireless support. They used the network card from RLAN to produce the world's first embedded Linux wireless router. And we'll come back to this uh, topic a few slides later on because it turns out that the router story has a bit, uh, has a bit more to tell. The other thing is that embedded systems typically don't use Intel processors. Intel processors are quite expensive, they take up quite a lot of power, and they generally don't have the interfaces that you want on an embedded system. So we need to make Linux portable and to port it to a range of different uh, CPU architectures. So the portability of Linux started uh, early on. I think the first processor uh, to be ported to was the DEC Alpha. And I think soon after that, the uh, Sun Spark processor was also supported. But none of those are used in embedded software. The first one that's really relevant to us as embedded engineers uh, is the MIPS processor, which came along in 1995. So MIPS is uh, and has been a very popular processor architecture. Uh, you'll find it in set-top boxes and routers and all kinds of other stuff. So that was the first what I call embedded port uh, of Linux. Um, soon after that came ports to Motorola processors the Motorola 68000, which was very popular at the time, and the PowerPC. Uh, the PowerPC probably was the most important thing because from that point onwards, the PowerPC became the basis of embedded computing until later on ARM took over. Um, as a bit of a side um, shoot, uh, there was a variant of the 68000 called the Dragon Ball, uh, the Dragon Ball processor was basically a stripped down 68K. It didn't have a memory management unit. So you can't run virtual memory uh, operating systems as Linux was. However, a variant of Linux called the Microcontroller Linux or UC Linux came along and it still exists, although it's not particularly well supported. Um, and UC Linux uh, was used amongst other things to run Linux on the 3Com Palm Pilot. You may not remember the Palm Pilot, but it was very popular in 1998. It was a PDA, Personal Digital Assistant. It allowed you to take notes and, and well, that's about it actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very popular. You weren't, a prob you weren't a techie person if you didn't have a Palm Pilot. And then finally, uh, at the end of the, uh, the decade, at the end of the millennium in fact, um, ARM came along. So it's difficult to remember uh, in, in these day, days of ARM dominance that back then they were a very small player. It wasn't until that, uh, that year, 1999, that ARM produced a processor that was capable of running Linux. Previously, their processor had been uh, rather small and not powerful enough. Um, but as we know, ARM have, have since uh, kind of come to dominate uh, the embedded market. Okay, the final thing I want to look at in this section then is uh, flash memory. Almost all embedded devices, even today, use flash memory as their storage mechanism. Hardly ever do we use hard disks. So there were two parallel strands here that uh, were required uh, to get a solution. First is a guy called David Woodhouse uh, started work on a bunch of Linux device drivers that would interface with flash memory chips. And this was called the Memory Technology Devices Layer, or MTD. So with that, we could then, from the kernel, or from user space actually, we could then access uh, raw flash memory. But that's not quite enough. You also want some kind of file system support for that. It turns out the way that flash memory works, you can't just use a regular EXT or whatever for, uh, um, file system. It just doesn't work. 
So uh, as a parallel thing, a company from Sweden called Axis uh, were developing a range of webcams uh, running Linux. They needed a file system for their flash memory, so they wrote the journaling flash file system, JFFS. And JFFS and its successor, JFFS2, uh, were the backbone of embedded Linux uh, for the next 10 to 15 years. JFFS has a few uh, fundamental limitations, uh, which means it's not used so much these days. Um, but with these two things in, ca in place, we could then move on to the next phase and start creating real products using Linux. So this brings us then to 1999, which I like to think of as the year of embedded Linux. This is where everything came together and people started shipping products. So here are three uh, example products. Uh, the first is the Axis webcam I just mentioned. Uh, very nice little camera. Axis is still building uh, similar devices, still running Linux, of course. Uh, the one in the middle is the TiVo uh, digital video recorder. So this represents uh, a whole lineage of embedded Linux uh, devices in streaming media applications, in uh, set-top boxes, in smart TVs, and pretty much anywhere else where you'll find video. And then the one uh, over on the right-hand side there is, is my favorite, the Kabango. You've probably never heard of this thing. Um, it was an internet radio. So this is the time when the internet was still quite new and we thought it was kind of cool. So it would basically play audio streams from various places. And as you can see, it was designed to look like a kind of 1950s style jukebox. It looks really cute. Um, and it was produced by this company called, called Kabango. Kabango was bought out by 3Com uh, and they announced this thing. Now that was a big deal because 3Com at the time were enormous. And certainly from my uh, recollection, when people started talking about 3Com using Linux, uh, people started thinking, well, if, if it's good enough, enough for 3Com, it's good enough for us. So that really kick-started people to start thinking of Linux as a serious operating system in embedded. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Kabango uh, product was canceled before it shipped, which is a real pity. So that's one of the reasons, probably the main reason probably, you've never seen one of these. Uh, there are some uh, units lying around, and if anybody knows of such a unit, if they could actually let me see it and maybe touch it, I would be highly grateful. Um, but I've never, I know there, there are a couple of people who do have pre-production units squirreled away in uh, garages and uh, attics and such. But this is, this is pretty rare. So Linux is now mainstream. People are, are considering it as a real operating system, a real alternative for these kind of commercial consumer products. Um, so as this happens, um, various companies spring up to supply uh, consulting and software services uh, to this market. And I bring these up because uh, some of them actually feature in the story later on as well. So professional help. TimeSys were the first to come along to, to start actively supporting uh, Linux as an embedded OS. And TimeSys is still uh, going and doing exactly the same thing. Uh, MontaVista quickly became the biggest um, embedded Linux uh, software organization. And for a while in the early 2000s, they, they were dominant. Um, but then for various reasons, they sort of fizzled out a bit. Uh, Lineo, a similar kind of trajectory, except they kind of crashed and burned, burned even earlier. But even so, I will mention them again because they did some useful stuff. Uh, and then last of all, Denx. Uh, Denx is a, a German uh, software consultancy, still going today. Uh, they did a whole bunch of very useful stuff and can continue to do so. The main contribution from Denx, I would say, however, is their bootloader. Uh, there's a bootloader called U-Boot, or Das U-Boot, to be, to be uh, strict. And uh, Das U-Boot is used in almost all embedded devices uh, to boot the Linux kernel and then to boot the rest of the device. <coughs> 
Okay, the next thread I want to look at is the mobile device market. And it turns out recurringly, uh, a lot of the innovation comes down to mobile. So let's look at the period up to 2005 and see what Linux did there. Um, so first of all, then, we have this thing called the Compaq IPAC. Anybody here have, have an IPAC? Hey, one hand. <laughs> I've got one as well. It doesn't work anymore, but I've got one all the same. Uh, so this is really the, the uh, 3600. Uh, it was the first mobile device that was really capable of running a full Linux. Uh, the uh, Palm Pilot I mentioned a couple of slides back wasn't really up to the job. You could just about run UC Linux on it and get a command line, but not much else. Uh, here we can see uh, an IPAC running X11. So we've got a graphical environment. We can run X apps. You'd do all kinds of useful stuff on this. So it was a really fun device. And this kind of kick-started a whole chain of events, uh, which, is still, um, we, which we still see today. A little picture over there on the right-hand side, um, the build cluster. So particularly at this particular time, there wasn't really the tooling available to build uh, embedded Linux systems. So they had a cluster of uh, IPACs uh, connected together by networking and using some NFS file storage for the results of the, of the, the builds. Uh, and so they built everything uh, using native compilers running on the IPAC. So it wasn't particularly fast, but it did work. <laughs> Uh, but we'll come back to that issue of how you create embedded Linux systems in a few slides' time. Um, this is an example of the way things were going, and this is a, an early prototype of what we would now call a smartphone. So uh, a guy called Jim Gettis uh, at Compaq uh, produced a limited number of these uh, devices. Essentially, it is a, a Compaq uh, i3, uh, sorry, uh, 3600 with a, uh, what they call a backpack. You could, you could fit uh, sleeves onto these things and add additional stuff on. So this is the backpack, and it has a camera, and behind it, it has a cellular modem. It has a uh, micro drive. The, the IBM micro drive is a great little thing. It's a little one-inch uh, spinning hard drive, which gave you which gave you a gigabyte of storage, which is far more than you would get from the flash memory of the day. Uh, it even had an um, accelerometer, so it could tell way, which way up it was. And if, as you rotated it, it would rotate the screen exactly as phones do these days. So this was way ahead of its time. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't get beyond this prototype. And hence, it was known as the unobtainium, because when people heard about this and wanted to get one, uh, they said, oh, it's unobtainable. I think they only ever made about 100 units. Uh, but I put this slide up here partly because it's fun, but also because it shows the, uh, the genesis, essentially, of the smartphone industry as we know it. Similar kind of thing. So we're still looking at these uh, PDAs, personal digital assistants. This is another one. This is from Sharp. It was called the Zarus. It was, so far as I know, the first portable device that was shipped with Linux as the, as the, the operating system. Uh, so it was shipped in 2001. Uh, uh, sorry, Lineo uh, did the software for this, and it was based on a 2.4 kernel. Um, a little while later, Motorola started using Linux in their handsets. So far as I know, this is the first uh, Motorola's handset uh, to run Linux, uh, the A760. And in this case, the software was done by MontaVista. So way, way before um, Android and iPhones and such like, we were running Linux in, uh, in these devices. And this is an iconic device. Again, anybody here have an N770? No, yeah, just me. Okay. So this is a nice little device. It kind of is, is a precursor to the iPad. So they called it a web pad. And um, it's basically a, a, a touchscreen 
um, uh, device using a stylus, um, and it did all the kind of things you, you would expect uh, this kind of device to do. Really nice little device. Uh, and it runs Linux, and uh, the Nokia uh, called it MIMO uh, Linux. It kind of lives on today. MIMO Linux transitioned into, uh, first of all, something called Migo, and then into something called Tizen. Um, and another branch of MIMO uh, uh, transitioned into what is now called Sailfish OS. Well, actually, it, it's like the lower level part, which, which is equivalent here, is actually called Mare, but Mare is part of Sailfish OS. So this little device kind of spawned a whole bunch of things. Okay, the next thing I want to look at then is the way we build Linux, uh, embedded Linux. As I said, when we're looking at the picture of the, the iPack with a little build farm next to it, it used to be quite tricky and require dedicated hardware and all kinds of fancy things. Well, it kind of still does, but it's, it's more formalized. So I want to look at the things that people did to improve the process of building embedded Linux systems. And to move away from what we call RYO, roll, roll your own distributions, where you do everything by hand, to doing things in a more formalized way, in a more repu reproducible way. And again, you can kind of see the strands kind of uh, joining together and then, and then forking apart again. So um, I mentioned a few slides back uh, in conjunction with the, uh, uh, the Motorola Dragon Board processor that run a thing called UC Linux. UC Linux is cut down Linux. Um, the people working on that project wanted a way to generate um, images that they could then put onto their, their target systems and test. And they got bored with doing it by hand. So they wrote a tool called uh, BuildRoot. And indeed, BuildRoot, although UC Linux has kind of disappeared, uh, BuildRoot is uh, used very uh, extensively today to build embedded Linux systems. <coughs> so BuildRoot came out of the UC Linux uh, project. The next interesting thing uh, is uh, a, another bunch of developers, this time working on the Sharp Zorus, which remember runs Linux, they wanted to load their own Linux distros onto the Sharp Zorus. And uh, again, they wanted a reproducible way of doing that. So they created a project called Open Embedded. So Open Embedded was actually the, the uh, combination of a couple of projects that existed already, one called Open Zorus, another one called Open Simpad. They came together, called themselves Open Embedded. Uh, Open Embedded then became a more generic build system, not just for these uh, PDAs, but for loads of different things. And then the story takes a, an interesting little turn. Uh, 2004, uh, there was a company, a British company called Open Hand, who were doing work on mobile uh, devices and Linux. And um, they were actually working on the Nokia N770. Um, and they produced some graphic software for the 770. Uh, but also a guy called Richard Purdy, one of the developers at Open Hand, um, he looked at what was uh, coming out of Open Embedded. And if anybody from that era remembers Open Embedded, it was, to be honest, a little bit flaky. And depending on when you downloaded the metadata from Open Embedded, it would either work or not work. And some days it did and some days it didn't. So uh, Richard Purdy took a fork of Open Embedded. Uh, he called it Pocky Linux. And essentially, this was a stabilized QA version of uh, Open Embedded. And a lot of people then started using Pocky Linux because it was more stable than uh, Open Embedded. A couple of years later, Intel purchased Open Hand, mostly for the graphics software they developed for the 770. Um, but in so doing, they also purchased Richard Purdy and they also purchased Pocky Linux. They didn't really know what to do with either of those <laughs> entities. So uh, a little while later, I think 2010, uh, they talked to the, Intel, uh, to the Linux Foundation and they forked it as the Yocto project. 
So this is how we get from Open Embedded to Yocto Project. Yocto Project is now probably the industry standard uh, system for building uh, embedded systems. And indeed, I, I did a workshop on Yocto Project the last two days. So by this point then, uh, we now have uh, a mechanism for reliably uh, creating embedded Linux firmware. Okay, I want to drop back now to 2002 and follow what went hap uh, what happened, or a couple of things that happened in the uh, router environment. And this has a couple of consequences as well. So this started with Linksys shipping this device here, another iconic device, the WRT54G. Uh, so this was uh, a nice little wireless router and uh, it ran Linux, so after a little bit of uh, persuading, uh, Linksys uh, released the GPL components of uh, this device, and that then led to people being able to load their own versions of the firmware onto this router. That uh, formed the OpenWRT project. OpenWRT is kind of based on build root, so initially, OpenWRT was, a, was just a fork of BuildRoot, and it kind of still is, but it's, the fork is a long, a long way back now. Uh, but OpenWRT is around uh, still producing firmware for a wide range of Wi-Fi routers. And I don't know, anybody here use WRT on their home routers? Good. If you don't, you really should do. Uh, because you get a lot more security uh, and, and determinant you know much more what goes on within the system if you use uh, OpenWRT rather than whatever you get with your um, obscure router software from China. I'm not saying that software from China is that bad. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it's not that what you get in your router has not really been QA'd that much. Um, okay, next topic. Um, again, one of the issues, or one of the, one of the characteristics of embedded systems is quite often they have real-time components. So by real-time, I mean you have a task that is initiated and has to be completed within a certain deadline. Uh, so real-time systems are things like, well, anything that has uh, something um, controlling something in the real world, like a con conveyor belt, or a production line, uh, a robot arm, a car, or whatever. And the issue is, if you don't produce the output uh, before the deadline, then the car crashes, or the robot whacks somebody across the head, or whatever. So deterministic, real-time software is important to, a, to a, a wide range of embedded devices. Uh, going back to 1998, it turns out that Linux wasn't very real-time at all. It was very non-deterministic. So, what happened? Um, the early efforts were kind of split into two different camps. One way of making a system uh, like Linux real-time is actually to have a second real-time scheduler, which sits underneath Linux. Um, and this was the idea taken up by FSM Labs with RT Linux initially. So essentially, when you install uh, RT Linux, it re-vectors the interrupts to the uh, subkernel. Uh, the subkernel can then do the real-time scheduling uh, and guarantee the deadlines. And then it essentially runs Linux in its idle loop. So when there's no real-time processing to be done, it then calls Linux, and then Linux chugs away. Uh, so doing this, you can produce uh, very deterministic real-time systems. There were some issues with RT Linux with the way it was patented. Uh, so the guy who set up FSM lags patented all this stuff, which then made it tricky to use uh, in an open source environment. Um, so you had to pay licenses to, to use this stuff. Um, a little while later, uh, a, a similar project, but an a totally open source project came along called RTAI. And there was some debate about the license, uh, 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 sorry, the patent licenses, but eventually they, they kind of sorted that out. And then there was a further fork of that called Zenomi, 
which is essentially RTAI, but uh, a bit more um, useful in, in uh, real-world projects. And so Zenomi is uh, one still available as one option for real-time uh, Linux processing. So this is Zenomi is used a lot in, a, in, in hard real-time mm, mission-critical <coughs> type environments. The snag with this approach, though, is that essentially you're introducing a new operating system which runs underneath Linux. So it's not really Linux anymore. Uh, so this, the other way of approaching the problem is to make Linux itself more real-time. And this progressed in a couple of uh, stages. TimeSys actually did some stuff early on um, with their own uh, real-time Linux. Again, though, it was uh, not open source. It was um, uh, protected by various things. So that didn't really lead to anything uh, that interesting. So we skip forward then to here. Um, first of all, Ingo Molnar and Andrew Morton, they started looking at the kernel and tried to make it more deterministic. And their idea was to uh, do this thing called the voluntary preemption patch. So voluntary preemption, what, essentially what they did is they went through the Linux kernel and they added in more preemption points. And a preemption point basically is just where you call the scheduler. Uh, so if you turn on voluntary preemption, uh, it means that when an interrupt comes in, it's going to take less time to get to the, the preemption point and then uh, preempt whatever's running now and run whatever should be running. Um, so that's good. That gives you part of the way there. Um, Robert Love shortly afterwards came up with um, a more um, innovative approach, uh, which we call the kernel preemption patch. Well, kernel preemption. Uh, what Robert Love did essentially is to make the whole kernel preemptible. So unless, uh, so when an interrupt comes in, we can immediately reschedule except that it turns out there are some cases when you can't reschedule when you're in a thing called an atomic region, uh, and that's protected by a thing called a spin lock. Uh, nevertheless, with uh, kernel preemption, we now have something which we call soft real time. So it gives you a fair degree of determinism, and it's typically used on embedded systems, um, and it's good for things like um, video processing and other kind of soft real time tasks. This all came together with the Linux 2.6 release in 2003. So with Linux 2.6, you had uh, configuration options for the kernel to select both voluntary preemption uh, and, if you wished, kernel, um, full kernel preemption. This doesn't quite get you there to the hard real-time environment. So after this, uh, Ingo Molnar and, in particular, Thomas Gleixner started looking at this into uh, other approaches, and they came up with some fairly radical changes to the Linux kernel to make it fully preemptible. And this is called preempt RT. Most of what they did uh, with preempt RT has been merged into the mainline kernel. So we have things like uh, schedulable interrupt handlers. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, high precision timers. Uh, and a whole bunch of other things. But there are a couple of key things that haven't yet been merged, even though it's uh, quite a long time later. Uh, and they haven't been merged because they do have an, a performance impact on non-real-time loads. So the kernel maintainers have kind of been holding off on that for a long time. I still think that eventually they will get merged. Uh, and we will finally have preempt RT as an option in mainline Linux. So currently it exists as a patch. You can go get it from kernel.org and you can patch your kernel, but they don't, produ they don't uh, produce patches for every single Linux version. Roughly speaking, every other kernel version they have the patch for. Okay, I'm gonna mention Android. Uh, so Android, as you know, is the most popular Linux distro ever. Uh, everybody running an Android phone is running Linux. Um, so Android was launched 2008. 
and it runs, or it ran at that time, a forked version of, uh, of Linux. There was some, uh, they did actually try, the, the Google engineers did try to merge their, their kernel or up, up, up mainstream their kernel changes. Um, but the kernel developers didn't like them very much. So there was then a period of time of what, eight, uh, four years um, when they kind of negotiated which bits of their changes could be mainlined. The good news is, though, that in 2012, most of the Linux Androidisms were merged upstream, and the effort continues to make the Linux kernel and the Android kernel uh, equivalent. Uh, there are still, again, a couple of patches that um, the Linux maintainers won't accept because they're really horrible, um, but they are needed uh, to make the Android power management work properly. Um, so that's good. So that's, uh, that's a, a bunch of users running Linux. And, of course, Android is available in, in various versions, inclu including uh, TVs, so it's running on smart TVs and such, and uh, smart watches and a few other things. And then I uh, want to also call out another big application area for Linux, and this is automotive. So Linux has been used uh, in vehicles for quite some time now, um, and it's kind of gaining momentum as, we, as, we, as, we, uh, as I speak. So we could probably say the first um, point of uh, departure would be the Genevi product, project. Genevi was a project from uh, Jaguar Land Rover, and it was a project to put together a, a, a Linux-based software platform for in-vehicle infotainment, or IVI. So I've got to emphasize here, we're talking about the entertainment system in, in the vehicle. We're not talking about the mission-critical stuff. We're not talking about uh, automotive, uh, autonomous, I should say, uh, autonomous uh, driving but purely the thing in the dashboard that uh, does the navigation and plays the music and stuff. Um, so Geneva, to be honest, Geneva wasn't hugely successful as a standards platform. Uh, so a little while later, another uh, initiative was the was Automotive Grade Linux, AGL, uh, which was sponsored by BMW in Europe. And, and Toyota and several others in Japan. Uh, so AGL basically build, builds on Geneva. It uses the, the same or some of the same components. It uses the Octo project as its build system. And there are now vehicles uh, being delivered uh, with AGL running their um, entertainment systems. So this is kind of the, the, almost the state of the art, except that we also have Android uh, coming into this area. And so Android, um, sorry, Google uh, announced Android Automotive OS uh, 2017 in actual fact. And uh, people are now working on putting Android into the head unit. And the first uh, vehicles running Android Automotive will be available uh, for purchase uh, early next year. Yeah, go on. Question? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so the question is, what, what do Tesla do? Uh, they didn't do any of these things for, to start with. Uh, Tesla, of course, do their own thing. Um, essentially, as uh, so far as I understand, they're, um, so they have this big 17-inch uh, touchscreen, I think. Um, it, they're running a kind of their own distribution, which is loosely based on Debian. So initially, I think they had a Deb Debian distro, and they've kind of customized it and tweaked it. And in terms of hardware, I can't remember. I have a feeling they're using an NVIDIA processor. Um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, yeah, so Tesla are not part of this. It's kind of, uh, it would be nice if, if, uh, if there were some standards um, um, compliance also with Tesla and they would kind of come into this in, in environment. But we'll see. Um, so, yeah, so there we go. Uh, in 45 minutes, that is the state of play with, uh, with uh, embedded Linux. So we've gone from zero 
back in 1999 to the point where today embedded Linux is the dominant embedded operating system. In fact, it's the, the dominant operating system of any sort. There are more people running Linux than any other uh, operating system uh, you can think of. Um, so a lot of this is down to Android. So there are over 2 billion Linux users as a result of Android. Um, as regards to other things, it's very difficult to get any uh, firm numbers because nobody counts uh, the numbers of Linux dis um, installations. Uh, but I reckon there are at least 250 million uh, smart TVs and set-top boxes being sold per annum, probably a lot more than that. Uh, Wi-Fi routers are another big area. There are hundreds of millions of those being sold every, every year. Plus, you'll find Linux in refrigerators and uh, it's used a lot in industrial equipment. It's used pretty much everywhere. Anywhere you need a computer, um, that, that particularly uh, devices which have some kind of uh, a touch screen or some kind of interface display, uh, they're almost certainly going to be running Linux. The coffee machines are probably running Linux. So Linux is now mainstream. It's gone from being the really wacky thing that I started out uh, doing back in 1999 uh, to becoming the thing that everybody does, and nobody thinks it's weird anymore, which is always nice. So uh, that's the end of the talk. Uh, we have uh, some minutes spare if you have any questions. The slides are available at this uh, address here, so take a photo if you want them. And there's also a slightly out-of-date version of this, actually, uh, in my Embedded History blog at uh, tunet.co.uk. And uh, yeah, so embedded Linux has been my life for the last 20 years, and I hope it will continue to be so. So any, anybody have any questions or contributions to any of that? No? OK. Oh, yeah, come. Yeah, so just to add on, I've been working as a security provider for set boxes for 21 years, and in the last six, seven years, I can't remember seeing anything but Linux. So you can basically say that all set boxes in the market currently run Linux? Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the comment is that uh, in the set top box market, Linux is pretty much 100% dominant. Um, back in, I do remember back in the day, people used to use VXWorks in set top boxes. Uh, but yeah, pretty much all BSPs from the uh, chip vendors are Linux BSPs, and therefore pretty much every uh, set top box is going to be running Linux, which is great. Okay, well, thank you all very much for, uh, for attending, and um, I'll allow you to escape and grab some coffee. Thank you.